So, welcome. I'm here to give you a talk about Unicode, going down the rabbit hole. And first, I'll explain a bit about why I'm here. Um, I'm a person who likes to do a lot of things in depth. And I've been working on a number of projects, and some of them have touched on text, so let's not go too much into detail about them. And the text that I've been involved with usually doesn't need a lot of Unicode support, except for the one for the case where it does. So over time, I ended up working for a company that ships products worldwide, and they have a problem that they started in a time that Unicode wasn't widespread. So they had Unicode support, except not according to Unicode. And then in Unicode catalog, we get Unicode support in the code base, side by side with the old code. Everything against it's forbidden and jumbled. And I start looking around the code base, and I find 26 different skin classes all meant to handle Unicode support in the old style, new style, mixing from back one to fourth. It's a giant mess. So I figured I'll try to figure out how to make this work better. So I think one of my old projects is making an operating system, and I will make it go do Unicode properly. And while doing that, I get into contact with Barbara and Ansel, who have an implementation for Unicode properly that should go into the standard so that everybody can just use it. But they don't have time for it, so they asked me to go and do a bit of making sure this is fit for going into standard and try to do that. So, sure, I'll go right ahead. We'll join standards committee, join the study group, try to get everything into standard, and yeah, long story short, let's go down and look at why Unicode is hard. So, let's start with an overview. So, we'll talk about the written word, the computerized word. What Unicode actually is, what it's for, where it comes from, what kind of corner cases we have. It's a lot of fun. Then we'll talk about C++ and Unicode because C++, it's, it has a bit of history. I'm afraid that uh, Bjorn may have said a few things about this already, but I hope he didn't tell you everything about Unicode. And then we'll talk about the future perfect. So let's start with the history of the written word. Can anybody tell me what this is? Not uniform, they are hieroglyphs. So these are Egyptian hieroglyphs. They are used from about 30 to, uh, 32nd century BC until about 400 years AD. And they had three kinds of ways to use a letter. So initially they started using letters more as a literal meaning of the, of the symbol that it represents. So the first one is a symbol for the sun. So write this and you represent the sun. The second one is a reed, the third one is a mountain. You can just look at them, you know what they mean. As time went on, they started needing more things to represent. And for example, the color blue is kind of hard to represent if you don't have a pigment for blue. And thoughts like, I'm feeling sick, that doesn't translate well to characters like this at all. So they started using symbolic characters. So the sun could also start meaning warmth. And later on, they started associating certain ways of saying something with a letter. So they started taking these symbols and giving them more and more meanings as time went on. That happens when you have a language that, that work, uh, goes on for about 36 centuries. And most of these, even though they're fairly complicated and curved shapes, they are written on or carved into stone. So this is the first one. Um, can somebody tell me what this is? So anybody? Traditional Chinese, step one. Any second ideas? Any guesses? Okay, so this is a trick question. Because there's four right answers. This is traditional Chinese. In Japanese, it's Korean and it's Taiwanese. Because all four of them use the exact same character set. So there's no way of knowing. In case you are actually able to read Chinese, this is Chinese. So don't worry, you were right. So China started with this and they started because they were the first one to actually have a written word. And it started in 12th century BC. Uh, they you call these characters the Han characters, so Han Zi. And initially, every letter is just a word. So the first character that you see here is sun, and the second character is tree, or wood. And slowly, they evolved this into polysyllabic words. So in, they didn't just have a single word. They had words made up of more than a single syllable. But most of the words still are uh, duosyllabic, so they're made up of two syllables. So let's carry on a bit. Go to the next language. We have Hebrew. 
And Hebrew is the first language, the first script that we see that's written right to left. It started being in use about 1,000 uh, years BC. It stopped being in use around 400 AD. And then it reappeared in 1800 AD. Oddly enough, this is one of the very few languages that died and then come back to life. It didn't completely die, but it nearly completely died. And the more complicated part is that it uh, lays out from right to left. So whatever we think about writing things, Okay. Okay. So the uh, uh, Hebrew script is the first one written right to left, which means that software will have a, more, a harder time of figuring out how to write things and how to display them. For example, if you look at the sentences that I've written, you will notice that the last sentence doesn't end with a dot because there's a bug in my presentation software which puts it on the right. The thing you find out when you do a Unicode talk. So we go to the next script, which is Greek. And Greek is used from the 8th century BC. And it's the origin that we know of for the words alphabet. They start with the alphabet of alpha, beta, gamma. So alphabet is the first two letters. It's an adaptation of the Phoenician alphabet, which came earlier, but it's not relevant for Unicode, so I'm just going to ignore that. And even that has evolved greatly during use, because it's still like 28 centuries long. And here's an example of what it looks like for those characters. The next one is the one that I almost forgot to put in the talk, which is Latin. Because I didn't think of this as a script anymore. It's just whatever we use every day. So these are just the regular letters. Multiple letters form a syllable. And trying to read anything from a language that uses these letters without knowing the exact way it's pronounced is actually really hard, because every place has its own pronunciation. And not just with different languages, even within English, the American pronunciation and the English one are very different. So let's go uh, on in time a little bit and go to Japan. Japan at this point has kanji. And interestingly enough, this is exactly the same that China had, which is hanzi, except now it's Japanese, and they call it kanji, which is Japanese for hand characters. They look exactly the same, but the Japanese didn't write them left to right like we see now. Initially, they wrote them right to left, top to bottom. And if this looks a little bit like the Matrix to you, there's a good reason. The Matrix scrolling text animation actually is Japanese hiragana characters. And the uh, story goes that the characters that they displayed are actually displaying a sushi recipe. <laughs> but we'll get to hiragana in a moment because we're at 5780. You'll see that in the bottom right, and we haven't gotten there yet. The next language that we see that's important is Arabic. And Arabic is a really important and complicated language because it is not just writing a couple of letters. It's also right to left, so it's like Hebrew. But if you look at the top, that is a word written as Arabic. And the bottom is that same word with just spaces added between every letter. And that means that this does not form ligatures anymore. And the ligature mean, is the way of combining characters into a, a sort of written way of writing things. And now you might be looking at this and be like, this is Arabic and Arabic has hieroglyphs, so until we need to support Arabic, we'll just ignore this. But what if I tell you, you've been looking at ligatures all your life and you've never noticed them. So let's have some English words with uh, ligatures. So we have shuffle, high flying, gone fishing and Sheffield. And all of these have, have hieroglyphs. On the left, they will have the hieroglyph, they, hieroglyphs. Jeez. On the left, they will have the ligatures, and on the right, they are lacking. But of course, you're at a small screen, well, relatively small. You're sitting far away, so let's make them a bit bigger. You'll notice that there is a connection on the left between the Fs and the characters coming after it, and on the right, there isn't. So this is done to make small fonts slightly more readable and to make it just flow a little bit better in some cases. So let's carry on from ligatures and go to the next script which we need, which is hiragana. So this is simplified Japanese. They decided that learning 2,000 characters is well, maybe complicated. So we'll just go for a simplified set which encodes the pronunciation for the letters and this is called hiragana. This is like an alphabet. And the older way of writing things, because initially everything was handwritten and people would uh, diverge slightly, 
the variations have been deprecated, and there's now a normalized set which is called hiragana. And the old thing that used to be called hiragana is now called hentaigana, so slight confusion. You see some examples at the bottom. And from this we go to, yes, Japan. Because, yeah, Japan. And they have a third script, which is called katakana. And katakana is used for transliterating foreign words. So the top one describes katakana, and the bottom one is an attempt at prescribing my own name. So that is Peter Rubinder Su. And you will notice that my name has an R and an L in it. But if you look on the left, they map to the same character. That's because in Japan, they don't actually have two different sounds, and they don't have to encode two different things because they don't have the sound differentiation at all. So transliterating two uh, katakana will lose information. And then we go to the Irish. The Irish actually did something in 500 AD that is sort of weird because they went back to stone written script. And we're not exactly sure why. There's only like 700 examples of this found. But I am including this in the talk because so far all the languages that separate words have space between them. And spaces are empty space that you don't print. Except in the case of Agam, it is not an empty space. Agam is written top down on the side of a rock, which means that you take two sides of a rock face and on the edge you carve out to the left, to the right, crosses and so on. Which means that if you take this and want to write it out in, say, a scientific paper, you need to take that and transliterate it into some form of characters. So what they've done is they've taken the exact way of writing it with a line drawn across it, drawn to the bottom, drawn to the top. They have a start marker and an end marker to indicate where the stone starts and ends. But if you would put an empty space in this, that would be weird. It would just interrupt the flow of how things work. So there's a special space character for Agam only that you do have to display despite it being marked as a space. So from here we'll go to Korea, which doesn't just have Hanja, they also have Hangul. Because they didn't like the way of writing it and they came up with a much more systematic and arguably one of the best alphabets in the world. And it is made up of simple symbols that are only sort of complicated to display. So pronouncing these, I've, I'm told, is very easy. I can't pronounce it myself. Um, but if you want to display them, you don't just take each character separately. You combine a group of them into a sort of combined shape and then display those in a sequence. So displaying this is even more complicated than either Arabic or um, uh, Hebrew because you need to figure out how to take a number of characters and figure out how to display them on top of each other, side by side. It's starting to get complicated. And then we get to, well, which country else? Japan. Because Japan had the Second World War, and after the Second World War, they wanted to simplify writing some of the characters. So this is the kanji characters, still used for a number of things. And they simplified this by taking them and leaving out some details that were no longer necessary to distinguish from older characters or that are easier to represent on modern ways. So they called the new characters Shinjitai and the old ones were now retroactively called Kyujitai. And only like 14 years later, China decided to do exactly the same thing, differently. So they took the traditional Chinese characters and made a simplified Chinese, which is called Jianhuazi. And they were inspired by what Japan had done, except they went just a little bit further and sometimes different. So they are incompatible. This was created by the People's Republic of China, so what we normally would call China in the US. And they are not quite the same. So to give an example, this is the, the uh, I think, character you would use for the word stack. So this is in Hanzi. And I would argue that you would call this Kyujitai Kanji, but if you put this into Google Translate and tell it to translate from Japanese, it's just going to say this does not exist anymore. And this is the simplified Japanese version. So the... Is this Japanese or did I mess it up? This is Japanese, thank you. That's very practical to have you here. Thank you. So this is a simplified Japanese version where they've removed the... Uh, these, uh, the gram on the right and replace it with a simpler one that has three lines through it. 
And then we have the simplified Chinese version, which is exactly the same, except it isn't, because they only have two lines. You have to look real close at these to know the difference. So at this point, we've arrived in 1960, and this is the point where we start having computers. So let's go to the history of the computerized word. Just to check, is the mic working okay, this one? Okay, so I have to stay here. Okay, so I will have to stay on the podium. Okay, so let's go to the computerized word. In computerized word, we have a number of encodings, and to give a bit of an overview, it's probably handy to have a bit of a classification. So when we talk about encodings, we have symbol encodings. We have single byte encodings, which are typically eight bits. Some of them are seven bits. And nearly all of them are ASCII compatible. So I will highlight that ASCII compatible single byte encodings are somewhat special because there's a whole lot of them. Then we have multi-byte encodings. Those are a bit more complicated because you read larger amounts, but these are still always the same size. And then we have the most annoying one, which is a variable length encoding. And for these, we have the self-synchronizing variant, which means that if you try to seek forward or backwards, you know where characters end and start. And we have the non-self-synchronizing ones where you cannot seek backwards because you may not know if, the, if it's the last byte of a character or if it's a single character. So in 1963, we get two competing standards being invented. Yes, they are in the same year, which is ASCII, America's Standard Code for Information Interchange, which probably everybody's heard of. It's seven bits, so it's only 128 characters, and they're all in a logical order. When you start with an A and you add any number, you will get to exactly that many further in the alphabet. And then we have EBSDIC, EBCDIC, which is the extended form of binary coded decimal interchange code. And that's an 8-bit code. Interestingly enough, it's actually designed to be compatible with punch cards. And the best way to visualize that is by taking a punch card with an alphabet. If you look from the left to the right, you will notice first the 10, uh, the ten digits from 0 to 9. And then the top row is punched out, indicating it's a letter and we get the letters A through I. Then we get the second row punched out, indicating it's the second row of characters, so J through R. And then we have an interesting one where the third row is punched out, but a single character is skipped. Because we don't punch out the next one, we skip a single combination and go to the one after that, because otherwise we would have two holes punched right next to each other in a punch card, and that weakens it. So we'll modify the character encoding so that the punch card's integrity is not compromised. So, going beyond this, we go to China, which has a character set called GB2312. And GB stands for Huoya Biajun, or National Standard. And that is basically, the bottom half is ASCII, and the top half is used for variable length encodings in a multi character set. And this encodes most of Chinese. They actually have in GB2312 7,000 characters encoded, so you can write nearly all Chinese. And this is one of those variable length, non-self-synchronizing codes. So it's not quite as practical in use. And then we go back to Europe, to ANSI. Has anybody heard of the ANSI character set? There's quite a few people. If you ever call it ANSI, you're wrong. Because the American National Standards Institute didn't have a lot to do with it. It's actually just DOS code page 437. And people will also call this extended ASCII, because it's like ASCII except longer, I guess. And it's 8-bit, the bottom half is ASCII, the top half is filled with some line drawing symbols and math symbols, the stuff that you would put in there if you hadn't thought about words like resume or most of Europe. So then we get to the place where we actually want to ship DOS to places like Eastern Europe, and we need to make a new code page. So we make code page 866, which is also 8-bit, bottom half is ASCII. Top half is filled with line drawing and Cyrillic characters that you really need if you want to be able to write Cyrillic. But what if you're actually in Europe? Then you can't use either of these. You use code page 850, which is 8-bit, bottom half is ASCII, top half is filled with line drawing and accented letters. So you can write the names of, say, Martin Horonovsky. And shortly after this point, we get to Windows, and Windows introduces its own code pages. We get code page 1252. 8-bit, bottom half is ASCII, top half is filled with text processor symbols, accented letters, and other useful things. So we drop the line drawing, we get some text processor symbols, 
it's not quite as useful. But what happens if you're in Israel? We get code page 1255. Bottom half is ASCII, top half is filled with Hebrew. So this is starting to get unwieldy because we have a bunch of Windows uh, code pages, we have DOS code pages, we have all sorts of mess. So let's try to standardize this. So we standardized this in ISO 8859. So we have 15 standard code pages. They're all 8-bit code pages. All of them have the bottom half being ASCII. And the big problem is that you cannot mix using them. So if you want to send a letter from where you live to somebody in Russia, you will get just a mess. Sadly. And before we go to Unicode, there's one more point to make about China, which took their character set and realized that actually 7,000 characters is not enough. We'll extend it with way more Chinese characters. We'll extend it to about 22, 23,000 and just have more of the multi-byte encodings. This is still a one or two byte long encoding. So these are the character sets that existed before Unicode. And basically this is a really good reason to decide that this is a mess and we should just fix that. So let's go to Unicode. And Unicode starts with a person, I'm gonna quote him, called Joe Becker, who said, Unicode is intended to address the need for a workable, reliable world text encoding. It's a sane quote, it's one of those very insightful things. We realize that this person thought about things and he realizes that we need to fix this in a way that is going to last forever. So he continues, Unicode can be roughly described as white body ASCII that has been stretched to 16 bits to encode all the characters of the world's living languages because in a properly engineered design, 16 bits per character is more than sufficient. <coughs> so Unicode, it encodes graphemes rather than just glyphs. So it doesn't encode the way a character should look, it encodes what character it is and what character it represents. And it's just like ASCII is just way bigger. So it's like seven bit ASCII stretched way further. And it was first incorporated in January 91 and they published the first standard in October 91. And they had an encoding for it because everything is 16 bit. So we just take 16 bit things, <coughs> bottom bit is ASCII. It has all of the languages in the world. So we don't do conversions anymore. We don't have GPK. We don't have ISO 8859. We just put everything in UCS2. Except that this is not workable because we have existing standards like email. And email doesn't do anything like 16-bit characters. It only has 7-bit. And 8-bit is not even guaranteed. So we need something to take Unicode and transport it over email. So let's make UTF-7. UTF-7 is not necessarily ASCII compatible. It's basically reusing the ASCII character set to transport Unicode across a 7-bit channel. And this works, but it doesn't work well enough if you're trying to use, say, a file system and try open file, because then you'd like to use something that looks like ASCII and only the special characters get encoded, can code it differently. So you can use mem compare and string compare and string length. So in order to be able to use those useful functions in C, we have UTF-8. Again, ASCII compatible, intended as a temporary encoding because we'll go to UCS2 and the world will be perfect. So this was meant to have C-style functions with 8-bit encoding support. It is more efficient than UCS2 if you're using ASCII. It is less efficient if you're doing Eastern languages. So Hanji, Kanzi, Hanja, they'll all be less efficient. And it's a variable length encoding, which means if you want to read this, you need to read a character to find out where the next one starts. So there is no parallelism at all. It is fairly inefficient in terms of what you would do in the 90s. We're still in 1991. But we run into a problem because we had Hanji and we had Hanja. They have 20,000 characters each. So if we want to put that in a 16-bit character set and they have 21,000 characters each and we have four versions of that because they sort of forked, we need about 80,000 of those just for these, which means we need 125% of the space we have just for Asian languages. And that doesn't work. So what's the obvious answer? If you're thinking about making it bigger, no, no. We just tell everybody in Asia to just merge everything back together. So we do a thing called Han unification. And we tell them, well, you differ in the way you represent characters, but we'll just, as long as it represents the same sort of letter, we'll just call it the same and you use a font to differentiate. Sounds reasonable? 
if you're shaking, no, that's probably the right answer. Try sending an email from Japan to China and have the person in China read it with his font. It will just display as Chinese, not Japanese. It's never going to work. So this is one of the things that happened because of how Unicode was designed. And it led to basically a bunch of things that are essentially originally the same letter being mapped to the same uh, grapheme, but different ways of displaying it. So this is one of the things that complicates drawing characters. Which brings up the question, what actually is a character? So if I'm looking at the top two, the top line of this, are these the same character? Anybody say yes? That's one yes. That's surprisingly little. Are they not the same? It's four. Well, Unicode will say that these two aren't the same character. They're both an A. What about the second line? Are these the same character? Anybody say these are the same character? Somebody here has figured it out. <laughs> so yes, this is the question. One of these is Cyrillic letter and one of these is a Latin letter. So they have the exact same glyph, but they have a different grapheme representation. And the last one is a simplified Chinese versus a traditional Chinese character, which is sort of the same grapheme, but not. And in this case, they've decided to encode it differently, but many other cases, they've encoded it as the same one. So there's one more character set to display uh, and to explain to you, which is the most complicated one to explain at all because it's not actually used for language at any point. And it was invented by Microsoft in the 90s, which is this character set. <laughs> and in case you've ever wondered why sometimes you get an email from somebody with a capital J at the end, anybody not using Windows here? That's because this is a remapping of ASCII to symbols. So if you ever got an email with a capital J or a capital L, that's one of these two. And your font rendering software says this should be rendered in Wingdings, but if you don't happen to have Wingdings, it's just going to look like a capital L. But this is the herald of a thing coming slightly after that, which is emoji. And everybody probably has seen emoji. It's an idea coming over from Japan, and it stands for E for picture and emoji for character. And it became really popular because it's a nice way to express emotion, to express things going on. And somebody decided to make a movie out of it. <laughs> if you've never seen the movie, um, I've just looked it up. It scores about 12% on, rotten on uh, Metacritic and 7% on Rotten Tomatoes. So it's impressive. But emoji have their own controversies because we have guns. And people want to use a gun emoji. But companies don't want to have a gun emoji for you to use. So they replace it with a water gun. And at the moment this was done, you could see a lot of rappers with games with, with a name with like three guns at the end, and suddenly they had three water pistols, which is hilarious. Uh, it's also really easy to plan a crime, like place the bomb over there, uh, stab this person with a knife, shoot somebody with a gun. That's not a nice way to use emoji. And the next one is even worse, that you have two of those that people choose to represent some parts of anatomy. Uh, there have been proposals to the Unicode Consortium to make the official representation look less like the corresponding parts of anatomy, which was voted down because, come on, people, <laughs> grow up. And there's actually been a lawsuit threatened in India for allowing people to use the middle finger emoji because that's apparently something that is against the law in India. So WhatsApp was about to be sued for that. And we can make more complicated emojis. So like we can take a letter E and apply an accent to get an E with an accent. We can take a woman emoji and uh, uh, use a zero with joiner with a reed to make a farmer. We can take a floating man or, or levitating man in business suit with a skin tone modifier and a female sign to make a levitating dark skinned woman in business suit. And you can make them even more complicated than this. You can make an entire family. And yes, you can have a family of all combinations possible, but at some point your rendering software will give up and just render separate people because it's starting to get quite complicated. But at this point, we get to the question, we've just added way more things into Unicode and it's not gonna fit anymore. So we'll actually go to UTF-16 because we need to expand our 16-bit character set to more than 16-bit. 
So we'll start with UCS2, the thing we had, and take some part of it, which we call surrogate pairs, and use those to encode more characters. So this is variable length encoding, and it can only encode 1.1 million characters. So the question is, why they couldn't just add more multivert characters? If the world is standardized in UTF-8, this wouldn't have been much of a problem. You just say, we have more characters now. If the world is standardized in UTF-32, it would have been the same story. But pretty much most big things, uh, Windows and Java in particular, standardized on 16-bit, which means that they really want something that works with 16-bit encodings. Otherwise, you basically have to deprecate Windows and Java and then hope that the world survives. So while you might disagree at this point, I think they have a reasonable reason to do this. So at this point, we have surrogate pairs, and they can only encode up to 1.1 million. But then we have a variable length encoding. So let's make a fixed length encoding again, because it's practical. So we have UTF-32 or UCS-4, right? basically interchangeable. 32-bit, bottom bit is ASCII. The surrogate pair cards are invalid, and it's fixed length. It's very inefficient for anything because anything will be more efficient in UTF-16 and or UTF-8. Bar none except for just a string of emoji. And it just cannot contain anything that you can write in UTF-16 by decree. And then we get back to UTF-8. You know the transitive encoding that nobody was meant to be using? It's actually a sort of a good idea. Because it has no byte order dependency. We can just read bytes and understand them. It is pretty efficient. We can encode emoji as efficiently as UTF-16, and only uh, Asian characters, the uh, Chinese, Japanese, are less efficiently encoded than UTF-16. But for ASCII characters, which even in, J in Japan and China, XML texts are mostly made up of ASCII characters, even then it's more efficient to use UTF-8. And again, these cannot contain code points that are inaccessible in UTF-16. But now what if we have UTF-16 and we want to store it as UTF-8? but we want to read it as a UTF-16 code unit at a time. It's a, probably a bit of a weird question, but in some cases when you have Java and it writes out a UTF-8 string and then tries to read one code unit at a time, this is the thing you want. So they invented CESU-8, which is a sort of half-baked encoding, which is less efficient than UTF-8, but somebody needed this. And then he came up with the question, well, what if we have a string that has a null byte, which we can put in Java and then write out as, as, as UTF-8, and we sort of still want the null bytes to survive and not string terminate? Okay, we'll make modified UTF-8. Same thing, except now we have null bytes that we can embed, so it's kind of weird because you have a null byte that is not a null byte. But what if we have ebc dick? Remember that encoding? It's actually not dead. There are people using this right now. And they want to use Unicode and EBCDIC at the same time. So they made a new encoding, UTF EBCDIC, <laughs> which allows you to transcode any Unicode into this and also support EBCDIC. But what if you had JBK? Well, we just encode all the other code points that we haven't encoded yet from Uni Unicode and just sort of put them at the end of what we had so far which means that transcoding to this is horrible and really complicated and you never want to do it, but it's possible, technically. But what happens if you read text with the wrong encoding? So then you get Mojibake. And Mojibake is one of the things you've probably seen a lot, and people get this very quickly. So the most common one is somebody having text in UTF-8 being read as ISO 8859-1. So that means that, for example, if your name is Billy O'Neill, your name will be Billy something new. And if you think this is a thing of the past, people still get letters printed with their name wrong because somebody used the wrong encoding. If you run a program on a non-American system, say Cyrillic, you will somehow still get this wrong. This is just current day software. And what happens if you send uh, somebody your physical address to print out so they can write it on a letter and send you a, a physical letter? Some people don't realize, and they will just transcribe the emoji bake onto the letter. And in this case, the post office figured it out, reversed the emoji bake process, figured out what it actually was supposed to say, and sent it to the right person. That's a really impressive thing. So this is the Russian post office. Good job. 
So how do you display Unicode? Because displaying text so far is fairly easy. You just take characters, print them after each other. Monospace fonts is even easier. So you back each character, make it into a glyph, calculate the position for a glyph for, white, for a variable length uh, fonts, and then you render your glyphs at the right position. That's easy. But Unicode is different because we have combining diacritics. We have right to left languages. We have right to left languages quoting somebody in a, right to le in a left to right language quoting somebody in a right to left language, which is, yeah, that. And then we have people in Korean, which have letters that we need to combine in order to render them. Then we have Devagnari. I always do that wrong. Devanagari, which is used in India, which has the same thing. So we need to take multiple characters, in some cases, but not all, combine them into a more complicated character, and then render it. And then you get to Arabic. We have ligatures that in some cases can take up to 18 code points and merge it into a single ligature to be rendered. So displaying uh, Unicode is actually way, way more complicated. So you start by decoding to Unicode code points. You normalize them, so we have a single representation for your string. We extract the graphene cluster, so the thing that would display as a single thing. We use a shaper to determine where to put things. And then we use, the, uh, we use a renderer to take those glyphs and render them at the appropriate positions. So how to do this in C++, we'll get to that in a bit. But first we have the fun part. So has anybody ever abused Unicode? Define abuse. Define abuse. So Zalgo text. Yes. <laughs> so how does that work? So we take just some regular text, so lorem ipsum, and we just add a bunch of combining diacritics. And then we add some more. And more. And this is still readable if you know what's going to be there, but it's a way to just mangle your text. You can cross the line. It, it can be unreadable at times. I mean, you can cross the line. That's the fun part. Yes. So uh, in some cases, these uh, characters can be so expanded that they will combine all the diacritics into one giant tree of things that will uh, block up everything else on your page. What if we just take like one really nice hiragana letter and just use some other symbols around it? To make like that. That's just a letter in Hiragana with a bunch of normal letters around it. There's nothing special about it, it's just Japanese. So what if we just take all the letters that we have and flip them upside down? There's no way of encoding in Unicode that you just take everything and flip it upside down, but you can just steal letters from other languages that you normally don't use that look like the thing that you're trying to display upside down. So we could just take this text and put it upside down. And the most fun one is to take Unicode abuse, where we take imitation letters from a different set that have a strong resemblance to the ones that we actually are trying to use. I think we're going to get a little bit short on time, so I'll get back to this if we actually have enough time. But these two are not the same one, and one of these will go to a site that is not the one you're expecting it to be. The first one is actually Apple. The second one is purely Cyrillic. So, C++ and Unicode. How do we start? Let's go to 1989. We have zero support. But honestly, you can't blame them because Unicode didn't exist. So it's hard to support something that doesn't exist. So, 1998. We have string, std string. The current locale with 8-bit characters. We have std white string, which is whatever your white character type is. So on Windows, it's 16 bits. On Unix, it's 32 bits. And the uh, white character type is supposed to be big enough to hold any character in your encoding. So if you consider Windows to be running in UCS2, it is valid and compliant. But if it's actually running UTF-16, it's officially not even compliant anymore to the C++ spec. But it's kind of hard to make this work retroactively. So we can't just tell Windows to go and make everything 32-bit. This is complicated. This is unfixable. So we don't have much to handle Unicode at all. And most of the things we have are coming from C. So we have white characters to multi characters. We have multi characters to white characters. That's about it. And then we get a long hiatus in C++ releases because C++11 took a long time to happen. We get UTF-16 string in 2011 and CAR-16. UTF-32 string and CAR-32. Anybody use these? Well, that's one more than I was expecting. Actually, two. So these aren't doing a whole lot. We get std regex, which works, as long as you don't use any multiplied characters. And we don't actually have UTF-8 string type or character type. So it's just sort of assumed that if you have a car, it might just be UTF-8, but maybe it isn't. 
We do have uchar and c uchar, which are the multibyte to u16 and u32 string and reverse. Note that there is no way to get a white character to u16 string or a white character to 32 bit and back. So somebody may have given up on white characters at this point. Then we go to the next version, C14, which brought us, well, nothing. Then we go to 17, and that gets us U8, string literals, which are not a normal string literal. But it does result in a character string literal. So it's sort of the same as a regular string literal, except that you're trying to say it's not. But we do have a way to encode a car 16 and car 32 string literals, so it is better than we used to have. We can actually sort of encode this. And we get SG16. It is finally formed, officially only in 2018, but the idea was formed in 2017. And this is a study group in the C++ standard committee to figure out how to do Unicode properly. We have other languages to look at at this point, and we sort of need to get on with it. So what we've done for C++20 so far is make sure that we have a standard U8 string. We have a, a car 8T. So we actually have a character type that says this is UTF-8, and it does not represent something else, and you can count on that. We have U8 string changed to be a car 8T because it would be silly if it wasn't. But this is actually a breaking change because there are some programs that will not compile. There are some programs that will compile differently. But this is going to be in C20. Now we add to U8, uh, UChar and CUChar the multibyte to U8 string and vice versa. But this is still the C sort of function interface, which means that if you're using a std string variant like U8 string, U16 string, <gasps> There is no way to convert this from a multibyte character string or white character string. And if you do have these, there is pretty much nothing you can do with them other than convert them back because there's no way to print them. So if you try to put them into C out, it will just say, I can't do anything with this. There's no way to print this. But maybe, maybe it's just me and I'm just using C out, which is not white character compatible. So I tried w, WC out and it just does the same thing. There's no easy way to use this. So at this point, we're basically at the point where we can't really decode in C++. We can't normalize in C++. We cannot extract graphemes in C++. We can basically do nothing with standard C++ at this point. We can use a shaper, and a good library for that is, for example, Harfbus. And we can use a renderer like FreeType or CS Paint, which will render whatever comes out of Harfbus. But up to that point, it's not C++ doing things. It's just third-party libraries. So this gets us to where we are now. Now let's look at what we want. So future perfect. For C20, we had the plan to at least have the groundwork. We need to have a car AT, so we have UTF-8 recognizable. We need to have a U8 string literal that actually produces car AT, because otherwise there's no way to make them and put them in your source code in a reliable way. We need to have a lot of details fixed, and most importantly, we need to have the Unicode standard referenced in the C++ standard, so that when we try to make new papers for 23, we don't have to put that in every paper and then deduplicate, merge, and it's just saving a lot of work if we do it now. So in C++ 23, the plan is to introduce a text-capable type. So we have a text, which is a string that knows what code points are, it knows what graphemes are, and we can enable Unicode support for parts of the standard, like std regex, except that we can't actually fix the regex anymore. It's uh, way too much used to be fixed, and it is something that we'd love to fix it, but it's sort of just impossible. The upside is that we have a compile time regular expression library, which is maybe a good replacement for that, doing part of it at compile time. And we are working a lot with Hannah to make sure that we do a lot of Unicode support in compile time regular expressions. And you've probably seen a bunch of tweets from her explaining that we can now match on whether something contains emoji or not. And I will point you to our Unicode direction paper, which basically points you to where, uh, where we want to go in way more detail. And then the biggest guideline that we want to set out is, given that you have your text, it comes in in whatever encoding, when do you convert? And the proposal that we all agree on is to make sure that you do the conversion as soon as you can. You receive text in some kind of format, make sure that as soon as it's in, you convert it to UTF-8, Keep it in UTF-8 and check your legacy encodings at the border. Normalization is a more difficult one because if you receive normalized text and then combine it with different also normalized text, it is not necessarily still normalized. 
So we need normalizing during string editing, but we do want to normalize at the border so things are in a standardized format. And this is not a new suggestion. This is not something we came up with. This is something that has been going on globally and has a manifesto on utf8everywhere.org, which will explain in a lot of detail why UTF-8 is the only sane choice for the future. And looking at how much UTF-8 and UTF-16 is used on the internet, you will see that UTF-8 use has gone way up, currently at the 99% mark, and UTF-16 has gone down to 0.01%. So for most practical purposes and many environments, UTF-8 is the same choice to make and most of the stuff you will receive will be UTF-8. If you have any questions about what we're doing in SG16, feel free to reach out on the mailing list. If you want to contact us, uh, contact Tom Honeman and he is reachable on, on his email address. So the time has come to make a choice. Do you want to continue living in the world of people who are just using C++, figuring out what kind of things to use, what libraries to use until the standard just happens to catch up? Or are you going to join the standards committee, join SG16 and help us make the world a better place? Thank you very much. So, time for, um, yeah, <laughs> questions. Hi, so say I'm in 2019 AD and I'm writing C++ and I want to iterate over graphene clusters. What should I use? At the moment, the best thing I can recommend to you is probably CS String, which is made by the Copper Spice Library team or Boost Text, which is made by Zach Lane. And both of these are inputs for what we're currently trying to standardize, but we are not entirely sure which direction is going in. In terms of what's exactly going to the standard, we are currently working with uh, John Heed, who is making a proposal for a string library at the bottom, which does encoding and normalization. Cool, thanks. But that is not quite at the point where we can recommend you to use it yet. Any other questions? Okay, then I will say thank you.